Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here, publisher of STN. This episode is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. And today I'm going to be speaking with Stephen Whaley, Director of Auto Gas Business Development for the Propane Education Research Council. And my co-host, Mr. Ryan Gray. Welcome, Ryan. Hello, Tony and Nation. Great to be back with you. Excellent. Well, Ryan, let's dive right into the uh, the headlines. I uh, I was reading a story on the STN website. Great place to get news these days. And uh, there was a survey in Ohio done about drivers' reason for not being school bus drivers. Right? Everyone's got a driver shortage out there. Seems to be always an issue. And guess what? The survey said it's pay. Right. People say, oh, no, it can't be the pay. Yeah, it's totally the pay. Right. I mean, the survey basically unpacks that and talks a little bit about kind of just issues facing the commercial driving market. But not a big surprise there. Why can't we get the pay up, Ryan? Anything we can do? Well, districts are trying everything they can. I was talking to with a uh, student transporter here in Southern California before we uh, recorded this podcast. And he was saying that uh, they've implemented, and they can't, they don't call it a bonus structure because they have to really, really politically correct because no one else really got bonuses um, or is getting bonuses right now aside from other, you know, previous COVID relief that they got in 2020 and 2021. But with his drivers, what he's doing is he's implementing $500 after they pass the written test, $500 after the behind the wheel test, another $500 at the six month mark once they're hired full time and they're driving routes. And then after the year, after one year of service. And he was telling me he really had never thought about that and wasn't forced to think about that before. There's always seemingly a shortage affecting the industry, but of course, we've never seen anything like it is right now. And I I think that you know, decades worth of issues are finally coming to a head. Um, pay for school bus drivers has never been commensurate with the job. Uh, it's always been looked at as a redheaded stepchild, if you will, compared to teachers and stuff uh, that's happening in the actual school buildings, not making that connection that school buses are an extension of the classroom. So I think that in the current environment with COVID, with the great resignation, you know, it's really become a a job seekers market and they feel emboldened empowered to really you know demand what they think that they're worth and you know school bus driving is no different so what this this survey really you know shone a light on as you said was that it's absolutely a pay issue now it's not completely a pay issue certainly yes culture is involved and we've written a lot about that over the past several years had a lot of those sessions at our conferences certainly people want to be appreciated They want to be in a more familial environment. They want to be appreciated for what they do. They want to be listened to. They want to have someone to have their backs. Um, And that's, you know, vitally important for school bus drivers. But they also need to make a living wage. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot that goes into that. Certainly, uh, school bus driving is, is not something that you're going to get rich at, right? No, no one gets into this industry to, to become a, a billionaire. You can end up making a, a nice life for yourself and be very successful, and you can earn much more than a living wage, but it – it takes time. And there are obviously so many reminders of that throughout the industry. So many of the people that you and I know and call friends, Tony, who started as school bus drivers, maybe in college, and they fell in love with it. They ditched their their other career path or what they thought they wanted to do. They got into school transportation. 20, 30 years later, they're a director. Maybe they're retiring now and they've made a good life for themselves. Well, it takes a while to get there. We have to realize that not everybody is on uh, that career trajectory. So I found it very interesting what Ohio and the, the members said. So this was a, a survey done from last September through October. So September 13th, 2021 through October 11th, 2021. 611 responses representing 338 districts. So I mean, I, that's got to be about every district in the state almost, um, if not more. They really pointed out three main areas that OAPT, the Ohio Association for People Trans transportation is really focusing on, you know, that is the pay, that's the benefits and hours. 
a lot of times school bus drivers, you know, they might be getting $20 an hour, but if they're only guaranteed three or four hours and then they have to bid for all these field trips and those go to the drivers with most seniority, you know, it's not really worth it to be making 60 bucks a day to be, you know, doing everything that it takes to be a school bus driver. So, you know, giving them that eight hours guaranteed is also a really big factor. You know, I know the other topic, Ryan, we've been talking about is the CDL process and the speed in which you can get a driver in the seat. And it seems just very archaic and slow. Now, I know there was some recent announcements in New York that they're seeking to kind of quicken that process up. What uh, what are we hearing out there on that? Yeah, well, that's a proposal from the new governor, Kathy Hochul. So she has done a couple things there in New York to try to address the school bus driver shortage. And really, one of the big catalysts for that is a school bus person, Mike Martucci, who uh, formerly owned Quality Bus, a contractor in New York. Uh, He's now a state senator, so he uh, won election last year. He's really been a big advocate, as the industry was hoping, for the yellow bus there in New York State. Don't know if he has any other aspirations, further aspirations, but it's great that, you know, we have a legislator who is really fighting the good fight for this industry. So what uh, he is uh, really pushing there is to uh, create, you know, more testing sites. So New York State, uh, and I was not aware of this, uh, I'm always, you know, learning more and more about how each state functions, but uh, normally what has to happen for a road test there is they have to go to a site and have that road test administered, usually like at a DMV. Well, what this plan is doing is trying to open that up and allow state agencies, you know, AKA school districts or, or fleet operators uh, with more than 100 buses to go ahead and be able to provide those tests um, come from a third party standpoint. And, and like I was saying, you know, open up more capacity for testing, open up more capacity for, for exams at DMV. That seems to be from some folks I've talked to more of a common sense approach as opposed to something like what the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration announced earlier this month, and that is uh, basically allowing states to waive teaching the under the hood uh, portion of the CDL skill test. So that's that that portion of the actual uh, CDL requirement or CDL testing that school bus drivers have to identify engine components. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. You know, a lot of the folks that I've talked to think it's that's kind of more of a cosmetic tertiary response to really the 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 real underlying causes, which is, you know, trying to case in the the CDL process because that can take a couple months from the time that someone tests till they're actually waiting to to do their road exam. Um, They're behind the wheel. So those kind of moves that try to move the needle and and make it easier to get the test um, when, you know, and one element of under the hood, and that's only a waiver that's available till the end of March, that doesn't really seem to do much. So not sure what the feds are thinking there. Certainly uh, interested in in trying to, to get some answers. They definitely had a press release out that that Department of uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Department of Education uh, Secretary Miguel Cardona, they added quotes to it and they were all they were all impressed with it. But I don't know. It's, it's leaving a lot of people scratching their heads on that one. Interesting. I saw Gavin Newsom, California's governor last week, signed an executive order uh, that included a suspension of the 100 day break for the service requirement that retired classified workers uh, such as school bus drivers and other transportation staff that normally must adhere to, you know, being retired from the school district. They can't go back to work. But that looks like he's rolled that back. Right. It's now you can actually go back to work sooner so they can actually get people in positions, right? Is that kind of the point of that, Ryan? Yeah. So it's, it, a lot of states have that where, you know, it basically, you know, precludes you from double dipping or, and a, a lot of what a lot of folks do is they, they might go to another state where the, the clock resets for them. Well, yeah, that, so that's essentially what, uh, that's one of the fixes that uh, Governor Newsom's trying to push um, here in California is to try to hasten that so that, you know, some of the brain trust, we can keep that within the industry and be able to 
actually utilize it. Some other things that were of, of note here in California. So they're also uh, the proposal for the 22-23 school year, the education budget is being uh, prepared. So with that, that's a proposal kind of shifting to back to electric school buses, another $1.5 billion perhaps for electric school buses in California. So that's something that uh, folks could look to. I uh, spoke to uh, the Department of Education and there are no details on that. It sounds like there actually has to be legislation that comes from that. But certainly, you know, uh, a, a big investment in electric buses, a big investment uh, in school transportation. So with that, um, some money to uh, hasten, again, talk, talking about the driver shortage again, try to hasten uh, the recruitment and hiring of drivers uh, program there at the Department of Education, I think $1.1 million or so. So there are things that states are trying to do. We definitely want to hear from you all. What's going on in your state? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Certainly, everyone has these pressures, but uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you guys um, out there in the nation. So Ryan, uh, I'm I'm continually getting more and more uh, notifications from my child's school district that there are more and more cases of Omicron, and we're definitely seeing larger waves of this affecting families and children, and that's causing some school closures. I know Chicago Public Schools they had been shut down. And I talked to a client of ours out in that area and they said, oh, yeah, my kids have been home for a couple of weeks now and they're driving me crazy. So I think it's uh, it's interesting that it's kind of different everywhere. But, you know, I know the discussion about teachers unions and shutting schools down in larger metropolitan areas and what's kind of that effect on school transportation, right? Uh, I think the fear is like, oh God, are we going back to virtual? No, let's not do that. But, you know, it came back to what we were discussing. Do schools really have a plan? How, how can they manage this? You know, and like we talked about last week, we've got all those tests that are being distributed to schools here in California and students. And, you know, they're even asking, hey, if your kid is out for uh, uh, my school asked, if, if our daughters are out, oh, can you pay the $47 per day that they're out of school so the school doesn't have to impact the hardship? And I'm thinking, well, I don't have to, but that they're being very bold about asking for money to help offset their costs because, man, they're worried that they're not going to get their state reimbursements. So, very interesting times right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, along with these closures, uh, seeing walkouts or sick outs by students. So just the, the other day, our local high school here in Redondo Beach, uh, in the district my daughter attends, the students walked out in protest for how they think the district is handling COVID-19. Something similar happened at Seattle Public Schools. They're calling for more transparency from the state's largest school district. So, you know, I, I think that there is a, a, still a lot of confusion, a lot of mistrust out there because we do see these skyrocketing rates of COVID uh, positive uh, tests. And, you know, thankfully, knock on wood, my daughter has taken a couple tests now. I've taken a couple tests. My whole family has been negative. Again, knock on wood. Don't want to jinx ourselves. But we were talking about this off air last week, uh, Tony. Everyone he still keeps calling it a pandemic. When are we going to change the nomenclature to endemic? I think I, I might have mentioned in one of the, the recent podcasts, uh, President Joe Biden was actually taken to task by six medical advisors um, that were on his transition team um, after he was elected in 2020 and he heading into 2021, that he really needed to change the conversation around COVID. This is not something we're going to beat. You know, this is here. A lot of folks are saying, hey, at some point, probably everybody or nearly everybody is going to get COVID. Certainly, we, you know, I'm vaccinated. I'm triple vaxxed. Uh, my family's vaccinated. 75% now of, of America, adult Americans now, they're saying, are, have the vaccine. Certainly, you can still get it if you're vaccinated. Um, but, you know, we get the flu all the time. We get the flu shots and you can get the flu. So at some point, the, the madness has, has to end. Don't know where, when or where that's going to happen, but certainly to your point, Tony, I mean, this is affecting transportation because we keep seeing reduced ridership and the industry can't sustain that. Um, school districts can't sustain that to your point of, you know, getting hit up for fundraising dollars. 
thankfully, I haven't been uh, hit up yet, but I got it's probably right around the corner. Meanwhile, I was mentioning California's budget um, issues. So they have a surplus right now. But Governor Newsom kind of tempered it all saying, hey, you know, school enrollment has dropped precipitously. And that doesn't even have everything to do with COVID. Not everything has to do with COVID. Birth rates are down across the nation. So less kids are going to school. Less kids are are being counted. What's that mean to transportation? What's that mean to overall districts and state funding? Certainly, you know, still we're in this this realm of, of a lot of questions and not many answers. But at some point, we really uh, have to kind of look at ourselves in the mirror and, you know, how do we – how do we keep innovating and move forward and, and get the job done, get kids to and from school or whatever that looks like? How, how can transportation, you know, fulfill the need? And we saw a lot of that during school closures, of course, in 2020 with meal delivery and Wi-Fi and school supplies and whatnot. So, you know, we're, we're definitely not out of the woods yet. Um, I don't know if we're, I will be out of the woods. Um, I think the, the, the landscape of, of that forest is just changing. Yeah, Ryan, one of the things I know you're focusing on coming up in our February edition is safety, health, and wellness. So we're really taking a hard look at different air purification, ionization, filtration technologies on the bus. We had a panel discussion at STN Expo in Reno in December about this. Uh, We're also looking at cleaning. What's the proper cleaning, chemical usage, wipes, sprayer technology. You guys, if you haven't thought about investing in this technology or it's kind of an afterthought, you know, this stuff, like Ryan said, it's here to stay. It's time to make that investment. There's ESSER money still out there. It's only going to be around for so long. ESSER 3, ESSER 4, you know, who who knows how many ESSERs there'll be. But I think at the end of the day, it's really time to take a hard look at some of these long-term health and wellness solutions because this is kind of the new normal, as Ryan kind of outlined. It's just that's the way of the world. And if we as an industry want to be trusted for children to be on our vehicles, this is a place where we need to invest in some of this health and wellness technology to do that. So keep an eye out for that February issue. But if you haven't seen it yet, the January issue is out on the STN website, as well as the 2022 Buyer's Guide, which has got a uh, large list of different suppliers that have a multitude of technologies that will help you. And you know, one company that's doing big things are our friends at TransFinder, and they know you're struggling with driver shortages, drivers retiring, having to quarantine, vaccine mandates. I mean, it's crazy times, guys. And TransFinder hears you and they they want to be there for you to help. And, you know, they want to be able to assist you with the tools you need to deal with the emergencies when they pop up. Just like an NFL team uses electronic playbooks to make changes in real time during the game, TransFinder's technology helps give you more control than ever. So when the conditions on the field change, you can make strategic changes that can reduce the impact on the families you serve. Be sure to check out Plus with trip absorption because the driver shortage is no game. Learn more, email them, get plus at transfinder.com and type STN podcast in the subject line to let them know we sent you. Don't forget to also give them a call at 800-373-3609 to learn more. All right, coming up next, I'm talking with Stephen Whaley. All right, guys, I'm really excited for this next interview. I'm here with Stephen Whaley from the Propane Education Research Council. He's the director of business development for the auto gas business. Uh, Steve and I have known each other for a lot of years. We just saw each other recently at STN Expo out in Reno because that just happened in December, guys. And we got a chance to hook up and chat. And, you know, Steve, I want to welcome you to the podcast. Great to see you again, man. Hey, it's really good to be with you. And uh, for as long as we have known each other, this was my first STN Expo and the uh, Transportation Director Summit. And it was awesome. I learned a ton, got to meet a lot of people. We got to do a lot of problem solving around those roundtables. And it was really, really good. I'm looking forward to what's coming up in Indianapolis. I believe that's June, right? And then Reno again in July. 
That's right. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're pumped for the summer. We'll be back on the normal schedule. I think it was such a weird year last year with moving the conferences so many times. Now we're now we're back on track. We've got transporting students with disabilities in March. We've got SCNX Indianapolis in that early June and then SCNX Reno in uh, in July. So yeah, absolutely right. We're excited to have you guys there. And we got a couple of surprises along the way too with STN Expo Reno because we have our Green Bus Summit that we had virtually. We're going to be integrating that live at STN Expo Reno. So we got some exciting stuff coming. This first time you're hearing it, guys, it's like a sneak preview. Steve just <laughs> drew it out of me. So uh, I'm, I'm excited. But yeah, you know, let's get into it, Steve. I, I want to talk to you a little about some of the things that are happening out in the industry Probably the topic du jour is infrastructure bill, right? There is a ton going on. It was landmark legislation for the school bus industry in particular. $5 billion was earmarked for a move towards green energy. Do you want to kind of unpack that a little bit for the audience? What this kind of means? What's it mean for people that are considering applying for the funds? What should they be doing? Is there a comment period of the EPA? Should they be commenting? What's really kind of the the next step out there and what should people be concerned about or what should they be aware about? Yeah, thanks. So this, this law is now on the books. It's it's got five billion dollars, like you said. There is a concerted effort from our leadership and our government to provide a clean, healthy, safe ride for our kids to and from school. And so they're putting their money where their mouth is. I mean it's five billion dollars. Now the way it's carved up as as it is, it's two point five billion dollars for electrification of school buses and it's two point five billion dollars for clean school buses. Okay. Things like propane, of course is is where most of this uh, has had a great impact. So there's there's two divisions of this and there is an open comment period. But as of today, the kind of the snapshot, if you will, we have just under a thousand electrified school buses that are out there in these United States, but we have 22,000 propane powered school buses, you know, with over 1,000 school districts participating in fueling infrastructure that's on their site to fill up buses and get those kids to and from school. And it's working quite well. So during this comment period where the EPA is is actually deciding on the exact regulation on how this money is going to get dispersed, they want to hear from school districts as to what their experiences are. And so going to you know, betterourbuses.com, uh, we, we've got some help there on how to submit your comments to the EPA and what your experiences have been so they can help better shape this. If we look at how Volkswagen was. Now, Volkswagen was a, was a landmark amount of money that was going to a, a lot of clean transportation. But specifically for school buses, if you, if you look at the $140 million that went into you know, funding school buses, we had $56 million go into EV buses, and we got 189 of them. Uh, we had $82 million go into propane funded buses and we got 1578 of them. That that's a big difference, Steve. That's a huge <laughs> difference in numbers, right? That's kind of shocking, right? Well, if we look at what we're trying to do and that is get the old diesel buses off the road with something very clean. EV is very clean. Propane is very clean. I mean, the, the, the propane buses that we're putting on the road now reduce nitrogen oxides. I mean, the, the, the harmful emissions that come out of the tailpipe that kill our respiratory systems to death. According to West Virginia University, their emission, mobile emission studies are showing that the real emissions coming out of a clean diesel bus as opposed to you know, a propane bus is 96% better. And we can do this for you know, $106,000 compared to a $100,000 diesel bus. And if you want to spend, you know, $350,000 on an EV bus, then, you know, for $250,000 more, you can get 4% better. I would rather put a lot more propane buses on the road uh, to be able to displace all that diesel emission than, uh, than the investment it takes to do one. But it's going to take all of these energies, all of these clean energies to make it happen. And our government recognized that. That's why they put two buckets of money out there to make it happen. But if we take that Volkswagen analogy, you know, if, if we had $50 million in Volkswagen funds going to EV, we, we were able to get 166 buses. 
Okay. That same $50 million spent in the Volkswagen funding for propane buses, we got 961 of those buses. So if you take that, you know, that 50 million and you put another zero on there and make it 500 million, because this infrastructure bill is $500 million every year for five years. So if we extrapolate that out, we can do 48,000 school buses on propane in the next five years if the EPA follows what you know Volkswagen did in the disbursement of the funds. Now, I know you sat in, EPA had a webinar where it was kind of opening for common and God, there had to be a thousand people on there. Our own Taylor Hannon sat in on it and listened and we were just soaking in kind of the thought process of it all. And I know there was one comment from Claire Miller, the uh, SVP of marketing and strategy and communications at first student. And she had voiced that look like the contractors aren't going to be eligible for any of this money. It has to be through public school districts or some of their clients are going to have to advocate. So it was a very interesting dynamic that they've been talking. And I know First Student has made a lot of investment in propane and a lot of the contractors have. It just kind of depends where you are in the country and the use case and what the clients want. So what does it really mean for a district? Why should they comment, Steve? I know you mentioned to be part of the process, but like, I'm a little district. Like, does my opinion really matter? It does. Uh, the EPA's comments are, are, are weighted. The number of comments, all, all of those things make a difference. Uh, now, by law, they, they have restrictions as to, you know, the competitive nature of the dollars for emissions reduced. By law, they have to follow the guidelines for uh, the underprivileged areas and make all of that happen. But there's going to be certain criteria that will have, have an effect on this. And so if you're currently using propane now, and and you'd like some funding for some more, um, then I would strongly suggest that you send the EPA a note and, you know, we can help you with that note at uh, betterourbuses.com. It's got a template there and has the email address at EPA to receive that. You could certainly go in there and say, hey, this is this is what we've been using. It's been working great. You know, we we can afford this. We have the infrastructure because propane is everywhere in these United States. And it doesn't matter if you don't have enough power at your uh, facility. Propane is a, is a fuel that gets moved around even in the most rural areas and can get set up to fuel your buses. And so make those kinds of comments in, in there and it'll go a long way. When people are making comment, what about the actual infrastructure itself? So you're talking about the buses specifically, but because this is the infrastructure bill, now outside of that $5 billion, there's also money for physical infrastructure. And I know the argument out there is, you know, electric infrastructure, it's expensive. You got to have utilities. You potentially have to do a lot of digging. There's chargers. There's also real estate and land configurations, depending on the makeup of you're in a very metro city. Land is expensive. It's hard to get. You can't just manufacture more land. If you're rural, okay, maybe it's a little different, but then you've got load situations versus propane infrastructure. What are we talking about there in terms of the comment? Are they looking for infrastructure comments? as well. And I'd also like to hear your thoughts on the differences in the cost structure and pain points of of infrastructure outlay propane versus electric. Well, let's let's do the pain points first. Okay, if you're if you're looking at replacing diesel, uh, most people that are using diesel have their own diesel facility at at their place. Uh, you need that because you don't want buses going to the you know the, the the local convenience stores to fill up and things like that. So you have your own infrastructure, and that's going to be necessary for EV, especially because you're going to have to charge in between morning and afternoon routes to be able to have the range that you need. But for the the propane side. And, and Art and I did this at STN. Art, Art was uh, was was asking me these same questions, and and he and and I gave him the scenario. I said for twenty five school buses, we're we're talking about sixty thousand dollars worth of station equipment to to keep those things fueled up every day. Okay, so it's not very much. It's a it's a two twenty thirty amp circuit that's you know same as your clothes dryer at home that uh, that you bring to that you know equipment and it runs you know all day long pumping, you know, 13 gallons a minute, just like your gasoline and diesel. 
Now, I, I, I told Art, I said, because he was asking me, you know, well, what is it on, on EV? And I gave him my best guess for what it would cost to set up EV station. And he went and checked with some of the other folks that were at the conference that were actually installing those. And, uh, and he said, Steve, it was a lot more. It was $900,000 for 25 buses uh, on the charging equipment side. So it's a, it's a substantial amount of investment, not just for the vehicle solution, but the infrastructure to make that vehicle work is pretty substantial. Propane's got a really low cost infrastructure part of this, and we can get propane anywhere, even in the middle of a field, if you you know, wanted to run a propane generator just to move the pump. Uh, so we can literally go anywhere. And, uh, and the fuel uh, cost, you know, I mean, you talk to some of the school districts that do maintenance and fuel cost savings, and they're averaging $3,500 a year per bus compared to what they were doing with their diesel. So it's not just, you know, cleaning it up, but it's, it's, it's making your bottom line a whole lot better, too. That's interesting. Now, in the EPA comment period, are they looking for comment in infrastructure as well? Sure. No, they they want to know from those who are using propane, what would be very beneficial is, hey, it works. It starts up when it's minus 50 degrees outside. I can go my 400 mile range with the heater or air conditioner on. They want to know that it is uh, a viable solution that works in any part of the country. Uh, whether it's cold or it's hot, you know, you run the air conditioner or run the run the heater and make it all good. They want to know that, hey, if we put money towards this, like the infrastructure law has 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 indicated, how can we get the best amount of diesel replacement done? But it's got to be something that works and it's got to be something that works in, in all those climates and in all those areas of, hey, our ranges are, you know, a couple hundred miles, especially if we want to go on field trips with kids, we, we need to be able to take them to, you know, a game here or a music uh, uh, festival there. I mean, they, they need to know that the fuel is going to get them there and back. Interesting. I know um, I was hosting a panel at STN Expo and I asked the panel, you know, what's going good, right? What's going well in your operation? And Anthony Shields, who has been on this podcast, who's the assistant director of transportation at Hayes ISD, just right down of Austin, Texas. He had talked about one of the really good things that happened there was they just took delivery of uh, about, I think it was uh, 10, 12, 15, maybe even 20 new propane powered school buses and replaced some of the diesel ones that they had. And he was really excited about that. And then he started chiming in about his infrastructure. And uh, I think you might've been in the audience and you overheard what he said. What, what kind of was the outcome of that conversation? Well, they, they had gotten the buses, but uh, they didn't have the most ideal refueling of it. And it was it was just, you know, he just wasn't aware of all the possibilities that, that he could get done with something at his place. So we talked, we got him set up, and he didn't realize that uh, propane, you know, retailers who, who love to sell this fuel – will give away that infrastructure just to be able to sell you the fuel. So, you know, especially with with more than, you know, five or five or six buses, they'll come in and actually set that infrastructure up for you, you know, wherever you want at, at your facility, you know, as long as you're meeting all the codes and they'll uh, they'll gladly lock in a a very mutually beneficial fuel price in exchange for that infrastructure being set up and maintained at your own place. And so he was he was a little excited about that. That's great. That's a great that's what great partners do, Steve. They help each other out. So I love hearing that. You know, one last item before we wrap up the conversation and we haven't talked about it at all. It's the propane fuel rebate. I know it always kind of has to get reauthorized on a regular basis, but I was talking to one district, uh, Northside ISD down in Texas as well. And I think they have over a thousand propane buses and they were telling me some numbers of the rebate checks that they get. And it was a lot of money. So, I mean, what does that mean in terms of playing into kind of the overall decision of going with propane? Well, since 2006, there has been a, a fuel tax credit. Now, don't let the title of it uh, uh, because, oh, you know, we're a school district. We don't pay fuel tax. Well, in, in, in places where you, you don't pay the fuel tax, it's actually a check in the mail that, that comes. So you keep track of every gallon that you use in your, in your school buses or in any of your commercial fleets. And it's 36 cents a gallon that you get 
back. Now, this has started in 2006, and every year since then, Congress has has put it in part of, you know, it's been about bipartisan support because everybody wants to have, you know, uh, clean clean transportation. So this 36 cent per gallon fuel tax credit has been in place since 2006, but it has to get re-upped every single year, Tony. Uh, and sometimes, you know, Congress gets pretty long into the year before they get around to doing it, and they always make it retroactively. So all that being said, we're in one of those, you know, we just started 2022. So that December 31st, 2021 expiration date for this has come. Now, Congress hasn't put together the next bill, like the Build Back Better included language for this fuel tax credit that would not be just for one year, but for multiple years. Now, until the next round gets approved, we'll just kind of try and be patient and find out how it's going to shape out. But every year since 2006, it has been re-upped. But uh, currently, it's not in place today. We have to wait for the next bill to go, you know, get passed by both houses and, and, and the president to sign it. But uh, uh, we're, we're very hopeful that in the in the next one coming up, it'll actually be a multi year so we can you know, kind of factor it into our budget and, uh, and lock in on that good propane price and know that, hey, I'm going to get another 36 cents even on top of that. Yeah, a lot of districts have a lot of decisions to make. And I think that, you know, guys, you got to realize you have a voice and it needs to be heard. And there's a very limited window of time, right, Steve, that the EPA is is asking for this comment. Did Is there any, I don't think there's a definitive date, but maybe sometime in January, end of January. So this, you got to get on it. Don't wait, right? Yeah. If you want your voice to be heard, I would do it immediately. You know, better, betterourbuses.com has a, has a template, has the email address there. I know, Tony, that you're going to be sending out stuff for, for folks to respond to in, in, in that regard too. Uh, but let your voice be heard and do it quickly because they're taking comments now that are going to shape the next five years worth of funding disbursement. So uh, make, make sure that your voice gets heard on this as soon as you can. Excellent. Really appreciate it. What was that website one more time, Steve? <laughs> Betterourbuses.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for jumping on. We greatly appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. Uh, guys, don't wait. Get on there. Check out that website, betterourbuses.com. Make that EPA comment. Make sure and secure yourself some funding for the future, the next five years. I know you guys need extra money to buy buses and, and new buses. It's always a good thing. So thank you very much for jumping on the podcast with us. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Tony. And I look forward to seeing you again, if not before, hopefully, uh, but at least we'll, we'll get together back in June at the next, next expo. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Excellent conversation, Stephen. Thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. Love talking about energy, infrastructure bill, EV propane, talking about that EPA comment period. Everybody make sure you jump on that, make a comment, let the EPA know what you're looking for. Our friends at the Propane Education Council, thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, as well as our friends at TransFinder. We appreciate that. Mr. Ryan Gray, thank you for jumping on with me and uh, having a chat. Also, guys, conferences coming up. We got Transporting Students with Disabilities, Special Needs, tsdconference.com March 18th through the 23rd we'd love to see you there we got our early bird discount to save 100 bucks also STN Expo this summer we got Indianapolis June 3rd through the 8th and Reno July 15th through the 20th all that at stnexpo.com for the details nation share the good word share the podcast get it out there social feeds all your friends in transportation. We need more listeners. We love you. We want you to listen. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, stnpodcast.com, everything you need to know, stnonline.com for all that good school transportation content. Nation, we'll see you next week. We love you.